And now we come to the portion of our service where we ask the Holy Spirit to move. You know, some years ago, I attended a, a seminar, and it talked about the difference between growing churches and shrinking churches. And one of the things that every single growing church had in common, whether they were uh, mainline or uh, non-denominational or Pentecostal or Episcopalian or whatever it was, if the church specifically acknowledged the work of the Holy Spirit, that church would not die. As long as the people were having a, a, a specific time where they were submitting to the work of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit would, in fact, show up. I think it's one of the reasons why it's so important that we do this. Not just that we stay alive, but that the Spirit would enliven us, bring us to life. Give us new life again in Christ. And so we're going to pray together. I'll, I'll pray extemporaneously, and then we'll close together by reciting together here from uh, Psalm 19 that's printed in our bulletin. So let's pray. Holy Spirit, you are the mover and shaker. I, I referred to uh, this last week about how when uh, the prophet Elijah called down fire from heaven and it, it occurs to me that frankly that might have been you we know it was you in the book of Acts when you came into the upper room and you the, the, they heard a mighty wind and then they saw tongues of fire over each one of their heads and then they started to speak in new languages and went out and they just shared Jesus with everybody they could we want you to blow through us this morning, Holy Spirit, to stir up our dust, get us agitated. I suppose agitated, moving, that you would not let us be static, but that you would be involved to shape us and make us more and more like Jesus Christ. And so if there's anything that's just merely human in this time that's not cooperating with that process, I pray, Lord, that we would forget that and that we would pay attention to the work that you are doing in our hearts and our minds. Make us like Jesus. Let that stuff stick. And so may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, it's fair week. Wrapping up. Jamie said, now, Ed, you, you better be ready. There might not be anybody in church today. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, a whole bunch of people cleaning up after fair. I said, okay, well. And I didn't say it, but I thought, that's fair. <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, now, when we went to the fair just this last week, we got a chance to see a number of our church families. A lot of kids were raising animals and showing them. I, the animals, of course, are being judged. Uh, and it does make me wonder if the people who are showing the animal aren't being judged as well. You know, this whole process of, being, uh, of animals being judged is so specific, I, I found out, that you can purchase a poster that walks you through, step by step, how to judge animals for a county fair. I, I thought that was pretty great that idea of step-by-step -step instruction on how to uh, correctly determine a thing we don't have a poster for the Christian life we do have scripture we have God's given word to us it's inspired it's useful for teaching and rebuking correcting and training in righteousness so that the person who belongs to God may be equipped for every good work that helps us interact with others. It helps us know what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. The reason I'm talking about this is because sometimes God's messengers will show up specifically to let people know what's not right and why. What's going to happen to them? That's what's happening in the book of Nahum today. If you will turn with me in your Bibles to Nahum, this is on page 1451 in your pew Bible. Nahum, Three small chapters, like Jeff said. Let's take a closer look at them and the four main biblical doctrines that we find in them. First, we're going to start 
by reading chapter 1, verses 2 through 8. This is a recap of what Jeff has read for us this morning. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on his foes and maintains his wrath against his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and is great in power. The Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. His way is the whirlwind and the storm and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and he dries it up. He makes all the rivers run dry. Bashan and Carmel wither and the blossoms of Lebanon fade. The mountains quake before him and the hills melt away. The earth trembles at his presence, the world and all who live in it. Who can withstand his indignation? Who can endure his fierce anger? His wrath is poured out like fire. The rocks are shattered before him. The Lord is good. A refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him, but with an overwhelming flood, he will make an end of Nineveh. He will pursue his foes into darkness. So, out of these list of the major doctrines that we've been finding in the minor prophets, we start off with number 29 this morning. Our 29th doctrine that we find in Nahum is that God is a just and righteous judge. God is a just and a righteous judge. In these first eight verses, we see that there are two sides to God's interactions with people. The first is a pretty wrathful side towards his foes. And the second is a loving side towards his family. Did you notice the, that they're right next to each other? It begs the question, if God is all good, if he's omnibenevolent, then how can he be wrathful against those whom he himself has created? How could God say that he's good and loving and then turn around and be wrathful? Here's, I think, how we need to unpack that. I think the key for us to remember is God's otherness. God is not like a human. He, he's not a man that we should judge him as such. He's not like us, and therefore his ability to judge is not limited like ours is. Our ability to make determinations depends upon perspective. We can only make accurate judgments based on facts that we have at our disposal. Our entire justice system is based on this idea. Judgment should not be rendered until all the facts of the case have been presented and all the arguments made, and only then can a verdict be rendered by judge and jury, right? Who else watches Matlock? Anyone? Good. Okay. When he goes into the courtroom, it's looking kind of grim, and then he goes through and he presents all of the facts, including one that the bad guy always forgets. He catches him on the stand and says, oh, but, and then he pulls something out of his pocket, right? And he presents the last fact, and the guy's face falls. And the judge almost always kind of sits up a little bit, and there's always a shot of the prosecuting attorney, and he's realized, Matlock did it again, beat me again. Justice is determined upon the facts of the case, and that's what Nahum does in his little book. He brings all of the facts about Nineveh to light. In verses 8 to 14, God warns Nineveh of coming judgment, and this takes place about 150 years after the book of Jonah. Remember, Jonah goes to Nineveh, eventually, says, repent, and they all go, oh, okay, and they repent. Well, 150 years later, and they've kind of let that go. He gave a warning which was heeded. So why this repetition in Nahum? I think the likely reason is so that Nineveh wouldn't assume that when difficult things happen, that they wouldn't just chalk that up to random chance. When their judgment is finally being carried out, they know that this is because of their sin. And sure enough, about 50 years after Nahum gave this prophecy, Nineveh fell to the Assyrians. Now, we need to see the holy part of God's justice. That in his wisdom and sovereignty, he brought Nineveh to account because it was the right thing to do. In each one of our minor prophets, we've been looking for the morals of these major doctrines. And in this book, I'm going to call them Nahum's Notices. And our first Nahum's notice is that God's justice is based in his character. Lawful and loving. 
wrathful and righteous. Our 30th major doctrine, as we keep moving on, is found in Nahum chapter 2. And that is that the Lord will administer justice appropriately. First four verses. We could see the reason for the attack against Nineveh and notice that it's tied to the restoration of Israel. Let's read together verses 1 through 4 of chapter 2. An attacker advances against you, Nineveh. Guard the fortress. Watch the road. Brace yourselves. Marshal all your strength. The Lord will restore the splendor of Jacob like the splendor of Israel, though destroyers have laid them waste and ruined their vines. The shields of his soldiers are red. The warriors are clad in scarlet. The metal of their chariots flashes on the day they are made ready. The spears of pine are brandished. The chariots storm through the streets, rushing back and forth through the squares. They look like flaming torches. They dart about like lightning. God carries out what was done to his people in the lives of those who did it themselves. Their punishment reflects their actions. At this time, Nineveh is one of the primary cities of the Assyrian Empire, it's, and it's known for being awful to its enemies. Archaeological records show that Assyrian prisoners were, this is kind of gross, sorry, but I want to give you the truth, impaled alive, flayed, beheaded, dragged to death with ropes attached to rings that pierced their bodies. Some of them were blinded by the king's own hand and hung by their hands or feet to die slowly. Others had their brains beaten out or their tongues torn out and were left to bleed to death. Still others had the bleeding heads of the slain tied around their necks while waiting for their turn to be tortured. These are not nice people. With such a reputation for savagery, how does Nineveh respond to this prophetic warning? We can see a hint in chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. He summons his picked troops, yet they stumble on their way. They dash to the city wall. The protective shield is put in place. The river gates are thrown open and the palace collapses. It is decreed that the city be exiled and carried away. Its slave girls moan like doves and beat upon their breasts. Nineveh is like a pool and its water is draining away. Stop, stop, they cry, but no one turns back. We see that Nineveh trusted in its military power. They trusted in their fortress, but it doesn't help them in the long run. By their actions, they lose it all. Nahum's prophecy comes to fruition like I said, about 50 years after he delivered it. And I, I think the end of the chapter gives modern readers, as well as Nineveh, an appropriate warning. So let's look at verses 9 through 13 for a moment. Plunder the silver. Plunder the gold. The supply is endless, the wealth from all its treasures. She is pillaged, stripped, plundered. Hearts melt Knees give way. Bodies tremble. Every face grows pale. Where now is the lion's den, the place where they fed their young, but where the lion and lioness went, and the cubs with nothing to fear? The lion killed enough for his cubs and strangled the prey for his mate, filling his lairs with the kill and his dens with the prey. I am against you, the declares the Lord Almighty. I will bring, burn up your chariots in smoke and the Sword will devour your young lions. I will leave you no prey on the earth. The voices of your messengers will no longer be heard. Since nations are made up of people, I think the warning is good. Good to remember that even in our modern times, people need to face their own nature. All the previous boasting and trusting in their own strength and ability has done them no good. It's time to face the music. There are going to be times in people's lives when they come up against situations over which they have no control. And it's especially terrible when found in those situations, their own words come back to haunt them and just heap more scorn upon them. Be careful how you live. Nahum's notice here is that God's justice is appropriate. 
It's not arbitrary. God's justice is appropriate. The Lord just doesn't smite, decide to smite because he's bored. His wrath, long held back because of the long suffering of his patience and love, is only unleashed at the right time for the right reasons. And those reasons are a large part of the text of Scripture. We do well to learn what happened to people in the past to gain insight into the character of the Lord. We have to be careful when we are moving through this life. In the same vein, our 31st major doctrine, found here in chapter 3, is that the Lord will administer justice publicly. Specifically, we see from the first part of this chapter, verses 1 through 7, Woe to the city of blood, full of lies, full of plunder, never without victims, the crack of whips, the clatter of wheels, galloping horses and jolting chariots. I'm reading this through so fast because it's, it's like prose. that You're supposed to get a, an emotive feel about this. This is not good. Clanging cavalry, flashing swords and glittering spears, many casualties, piles of dead bodies without number, people stumbling over the corpses. <gasps> All because of the wanton lust of a harlot alluring the mistress of sorceries who enslaved nations by her prostitution and her peoples by her witchcraft. I am against you, declares the Lord Almighty. I will lift your skirts over your face. I will show the nations your nakedness and the kingdoms your shame. I will pelt you with filth. I will treat you with contempt and make you a spectacle. All who see you will flee from you and say, Nineveh is in ruins. Who will mourn for her? Where can I find anyone to comfort you? This first section, which deals with how the Lord's justice is going to be administered publicly, helps us to grasp what kind of people the Ninevites were. They took pride in causing pain and shame. They reveled in their ability to subjugate others, to bring them low. This is seen in archaeology. The, the website, if in case you'd like to go look this up, called biblicalarchaeology.org. Rabbit hole warning. If you like to learn stuff you didn't know before, you can spend a lot of time. It shows photographs of a number of carvings which showed the terrible things that the Assyrians did to their enemies. They were proud enough of their savagery that they carved it into stone to preserve it for future generations to see. That's not what societies tend to do today. Modern nations take great pains to wipe out any admission to previously committed crimes against their enemies. Modern day children in Japan aren't taught about their actions of their great great grandfathers in World War II in South Asia. History books in the United States don't mention the Tulsa race massacre. English children don't learn about the pillaging of Tibet or the English famine, or the Mau Mau concentration camps. It's, it's very difficult for a nation to face its own failings, and even more challenging to pass along admission of those faults to the next generation. But Nineveh? They carved that stuff into stone. In fact, the carving themselves are even mentioned in the book, in chapter 1, verse 14. History shows that Nineveh's armies were available to anyone who could pay. And what does she do with the spoils of this mercenary military? She enslaves even more people as a means of extending her influence. And when we read verses 5 through 7 in chapter 3, the descriptions are so explicitly personal against Nineveh, it's, it's uncomfortable to read them. It's worse to read them out loud in front of you, let me tell you. <laughs> But I don't want to shy away from that stuff. I think a reasonable explanation here is that they had subjugated others through secrecy and back table dealings. One of the things that Nineveh was known for was making treaties with other countries. And then as soon as they entered into the formal treaty, they would renege and then apply pressure and extract tributes and taxes from the weaker people with whom they had made these treaties. She is receiving what she justly deserves. And instead of secrets, everything is being made known. That's the conversation about the skirts being up over the head. So Nahum's notice. 
for this third doctrine that we see this morning is that God's justice is to show his holiness in comparison to our wickedness. God's justice is to show his holiness in comparison to our wickedness. Finally, our major doctrine, number 32, is that the Lord will administer justice completely. We'll pick this up in the third chapter, verses 8 through 15. Are you better than Thebes, situated on the Nile with water around her? The river was her defense, the waters her wall. Cush and Egypt were her boundless strength. Put and Libya were among her allies, and yet she was taken captive and went into exile. Her infants were dashed to pieces at the head of every street. Lots were cast for her nobles, and all her great men were put into chains. You, too, will become drunk. You will go into hiding and seek refuge from the enemy. This is being directly talked to Nineveh now. All of your fortresses are like fig trees with their first ripe fruit. When they are shaken, the figs fall into the mouth of the eater. Look at your troops. They're all women. The gates of your land are wide open to your enemies. Fire has consumed their bars. Draw water for the siege. Strengthen your defenses. Work the clay. Tread the mortar. Repair the brickwork. There the fire will devour you. The sword will cut you down and like grasshoppers consume you. Multiply like grasshoppers. Multiply like locusts. Now, notice this comparison with Thebes. Now, Thebes at the time was the most important city in North Africa. The height of civilization and the Nile. Why is uh, Thebes going to fall? Because it did fall. Manasseh saw that. What's the chance that Nineveh has to stand against God's wrath as revealed in the actions of its enemies? Verses 12 to 15 prompt us to ask this question. Why the warning to strengthen the defenses? So that when they fall, and they did, Nineveh will have to face up to the fact that they do not have the power to defeat God. God is the one who's prompting these other nations to invade, and they can't stand against him. As we're wrapping up our look through Nahum, let's look at chapter 3, verses 16 through 19. You've increased the number of your merchants until they are more than the stars of the sky, but by like locusts, they strip the land and then fly away. Your guards are like locusts, your officials like swarms of locusts that settle in the walls on a cold day, but when the sun appears, they fly away, and no one knows where. Why the warning about the classes of people? Well, think about this, about the the merchants and the guards and the officials. Nineveh can't take refuge in their architecture alone. If Thebes fell, where the armies had to get to them by boat, Nineveh doesn't stand a chance. She can't take refuge in their architecture and she can't take refuge in their people because the people are going to see that tough stuff has come down and they are going to bail. They did. They will desert her and leave her without recourse and the whole world is going to rejoice in her downfall. And they did. And they did so justly because of Nineveh's actions. So our last Nahum notice is that God's justice isn't punishment. God's justice isn't punishment. It's not intended to cause pain. It's intended to bring about repentance. Hear these very last words from Nahum. O king of Assyria, your shepherds slumber. Your nobles lie down to rest. Your people are scattered on the mountains with no one to gather them. Nothing can heal your wound. Your injury is fatal. Everyone who hears the words about you claps his hands at your fall, for who has not felt your endless cruelty? Now, all this year, I've been trying to intentionally tie our Sunday morning studies to the idea that we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart and our soul and our mind and our strength. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Here's what keeps coming to mind. As I'm thinking about how the message of Nahum might have been received by Nineveh, especially with these last words of warning. Societies can make systemically bad decisions. 
Just because a country, a, a group of people decide that they're gonna call themselves a country doesn't automatically mean they're going to make great decisions. Sometimes they make rotten ones. Nineveh did. Rome did. Spain, England, Germany, Russia, the United States, the list of nations that in one way or another have made rotten decisions that hurt people is long. But when a nation is brought to its final judgment, does it realize that that's God's judgment? Or do they just ignore the downfall and blame it on circumstances? We need to be careful in how we live. It is our responsibility to borrow a phrase from Micah. He has shown you, O man, O woman, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. For us, as individuals and as members of a community, we need to recognize that it is God who brings about true repentance and appropriate justice. It is his job to call us to repentance, to put up with improper behavior, and ultimately to be the only judge of others. That's his job. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for this perfect and sovereign and wonderful justice that you have. You know all the facts in evidence. You know every perspective that could be had. And so when you administer justice, you do so correctly. Help us to walk in fellowship with you. Help us to walk in a relationship with Jesus so that we're doing our level best to follow the master and not follow our own feelings and desires and motivations. Make us like Jesus. Take our lives and let them be yours. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.